Well, good morning. Welcome to Mount Pleasant. My name is Andrew Philbeck. I am in charge of the home groups here, and I'm excited to be with you this morning as we continue on in our series through the Gospel of Matthew called Let's Talk About Jesus. Uh, my dad is preaching at a church in Florida this weekend, Pastor Chris in Florida this weekend, so we can all feel really sorry for him, uh, as you might imagine. Uh, he, it's actually exciting. He gets to preach at uh, Bruce Humphrey's church this weekend. Many of you know Bruce. He was our high school pastor here for several years, so uh, my dad's down there spending some time with them and speaking in uh, their church. Uh, we are continuing our series this morning through the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, our goal is to basically learn all that we can about Jesus. I think it's pretty straightforward in that regard. It's certainly a good goal. But at the same time, I want to make sure that we don't just learn about Jesus. I also want to make sure that we learn from Jesus. That's what I want to happen this morning. We want to follow his example. We want to strive to be more like him in his holiness and his love and his grace and his service and in so many other ways. While there is always value in learning all that you can learn about the scriptures, we need to understand that the goal is not knowledge simply for the sake of knowledge. The goal is knowledge for the sake of action, knowledge for the sake of change. And I realize, and I'm sure you're aware of this as well, that sometimes, depending on the passage, sometimes depending on the scripture, you know what, it is just easier to learn about Jesus than it is to learn from Jesus. Some passages lend themselves more toward building knowledge than they do application, and there is not anything wrong with that. Our text this morning, though, is great because I think it gives us a healthy dose of both. In our passage today, Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, you can go ahead and turn there if you haven't done that already, we see a healthy dose of both knowledge and application. And while there is always an opportunity to grow whenever we study Scripture, my goal this morning is, is really to focus more on the application that we see in this passage. And the reason that I say that is because my goal this morning is to help us in our fight against temptation. I want to help us in our fight against temptation by looking at how Jesus handled temptation. And this is a reality that we all need to be aware of. This is, this is a truth in our lives. We all need to have a plan to fight against temptation. Temptation is a constant part of life. You could say that it is a relentless part of life. When I was in high school, uh, one weekend here, some friends of mine and I went out to lunch after service one weekend, and like the good pastor's kid that I am, I said, you know, well, what did you think of church? Well, you know, they loved it, of course. What are they going to say to me? Um, but I did have a friend who, who told me, you know, even though the sermon was about forgiveness, that she didn't feel like she got a whole lot out of it because it didn't really apply to her. Here's the deal this morning. This sermon applies to all of us. It applies to every single person listening, no matter where you are. And I'm not saying that because I think it's going to be the greatest sermon you've ever heard. I'm saying it because I know that it is relevant to us because we all know what it's like to face temptation. All right, so having said that, let's go ahead and read our passage before we do anything else. Would you stand with me wherever you are for the reading of God's Word? I'm going to read Matthew chapter 4. Verses 1 through 11, you can follow along as I read aloud. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you were the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended him. Thank you. You may be seated. May God add his blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word. I've heard before 
Now, the best time to bring donuts to your office is the first day back after New Year's because you will get to eat them all yourself. (laughs) Everybody's still strong in their resolutions. Everybody's still carrying around enough guilt from whatever they ate over the holidays that they can withstand the temptation you have put before them. Maybe you know someone who's done this. Maybe they weren't being as generous as you thought they were. Maybe you want to pencil this in in your calendar to give it a shot next year, see what happens. You know, for some people, food can be a very real temptation. Some of us have all sorts of willpower when it comes to difficulties at work or problematic or temperamental children, but the moment that they have a chocolate cake put in front of them, they lose all self-control. Maybe you know someone like that. For others, it can be the exact opposite. Uh, Some of you wouldn't dream of putting anything into your body that wasn't dairy-free, soy-free, gluten-free, fat-free, flavor-free. But the moment, (laughs) the moment the printer breaks down or the moment your child tells you no or the moment your child backtalks you, you just break down. You lose everything. Some people are tempted to lose their temper. Some people are tempted to lie or to steal. Some people massage the truth in order to make themselves look a little bit better from time to time. The truth is, we are all tempted in a variety of different ways. And the reason I say that this morning is because there's no way that we could gather together and specifically talk about, target, and come up with a plan for each and every temptation that we face on a day-to-day basis. I don't believe that's really what we're supposed to do. As I've been saying, the temptations vary so widely that I think it would be foolish to try and do that. What I think we can do and what I want to try and do this morning is to look at temptation from a foundational level. You see, the ways in which Jesus was tempted are the same ways you and I are tempted. Now, I don't believe that anyone here this morning can turn stones into bread, but I do believe that, as I said, when we look at it from a foundational level, we are tempted the same ways he was. And the reality is, if we can strengthen our foundation, then we can strengthen our ability to stand up under the weight of temptation. Think about it like this. If you struggle with giving into a certain temptation over and over and over again, I think we all know what this is like uh, in our lives. You just can't seem to get it under control. One of the best things that you can do is to basically take a step back to pray about it, think about it, and then ask yourself this question. What is the problem underneath the problem? What is the problem underneath the problem? That's not a question that's original with me, but I love it because I know that there's great power in it. This is the why question. Why is this an issue in my life? Why do I keep doing this? Why is this a problem for me? And here's the deal. I would never make light of some of the battles that people face in their spiritual lives. And I'm not saying this morning that this is the only step we need to take in our fight against temptation. But I believe that what happens sometimes is that we end up fighting the symptoms rather than the disease, if that makes sense. We spend all of our time trying to correct a behavior rather than spending our time trying to get to the root of what is causing that behavior. I mean, imagine imagine that you're walking around on a broken foot. I don't know. You don't know that it's broken, but you have a broken foot, and so every single time you take a step, it hurts. There's pain. And so you go to the doctor. But rather than taking x-rays, rather than looking at your foot, all you get is medication. Well, with enough medication, maybe you can walk around for a while without any pain. Maybe it can be hours on end, but eventually the pain comes back because you've never dealt with the real issue. You've only dealt with the pain. You've only dealt with the symptoms. This is why far too many Christians experience lasting change because they spend all of their time fighting the symptoms. Hopefully, we can improve on that this morning in our study. So here's what I want us to do. I want to spend some time talking about what I'm just going to call one big truth. One big truth and the implications that it has that we all need to understand. And then we're going to look through each of the temptations one by one and deal with them. So one big truth. It is not a sin to be tempted. 
It is not a sin to be tempted. Now, growing up in church, I've heard this more times than I can count. I've said this more times than I can count. But I don't know what everyone else has heard. I don't know what everyone else has learned. I don't know what you were told when you were young when it came to temptation, when it came to sin. So before we do anything else, I want to say this loud and I want to say it clear. It is not a sin to be tempted. The truth is, it's just a part of life. It's just a part of life. So if you need to write that down, if you need to tell it to your neighbor, if you need to stick it on your refrigerator door so you see it every morning, whatever you need to do to remember that, do it. It is not a sin to be tempted. Matthew 4 verse 1 says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. As soon as Jesus' baptism was complete, he was tempted. That's what we read about last week in Matthew chapter 3. Jesus was baptized. As soon as that happens, he's tempted. Now, the Greek word here for tempted is the word pirazo, and it's, it's a neutral word. It simply means to test. Now, whether the purpose of the test is for good or for evil, that all depends on the one giving the test. And in this transition from Matthew 3 to Matthew 4, I think we see a reality of life that we all need to understand. Maybe you're already aware of it, but we just don't like it. It's this reality that after every victory comes temptation. After every victory comes temptation. Jesus was baptized. This is a victory. I know my dad talked about this a little bit last week. You know, he's Jesus. He was sinless. Why did he have to be baptized? Regardless of that, Jesus is baptized. It's a victory. And as soon as that's done, he's tempted. And we see this in other parts of the scripture as well. In the Old Testament, you have the prophet Elijah. He experiences this monumental victory. When fire rains down from heaven and he defeats the prophets of Baal. And what happens next? He's fleeing for his life. He's actually asking God to take away his life because he can't stand up under the threats of Jezebel. He's tempted to quit. He's tempted to give in. The Israelites, they leave Egypt after years of slavery in this amazing moment of salvation. But instead of celebrating the whole way, once they realize that Pharaoh has changed his mind and he's after them again, they're tempted to give in to fear. They want to go back. They say, why did we even do this in the first place? Was this part of God's plan all along? They lose all of their faith. They lose all of their confidence. The Apostle Peter You know, when Jesus is arrested in the garden before his crucifixion, Peter doesn't flee with the others. He follows Jesus. He wants to be near him. He wants to know what's going to happen. And listen, you might disagree with me on this this morning, but I think that's a victory. I think that shows a lot of courage. I think it shows just how important Jesus was to him. But what happens? He's tempted three times to deny who he is, to lie about his identity as he tries to stay close to Jesus. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12 and 13 says, So, if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Now, I know, I know this is pessimistic this morning. Uh, You might think that it's pessimistic this morning. I would just say that it's realistic. It's realistic. We have an enemy who tries to get us when we least expect it, when we are at our most vulnerable, and this is just a reality of life. If we are not aware of this, we are setting ourselves up for failure from the very beginning. Getting back to our text, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert. He's fasting, um, and the Bible tells us that he's hungry. He's hungry. Now, I doubt that this applied to Jesus. I I can't say 100% sure, but I doubt that this applied to Jesus. But does anyone here this morning know what it's like to be hangry? You ever heard that? That beautiful marriage of being hungry and angry all at the same time. Maybe you know someone who deals with that, but you don't want to mention it because you know they didn't eat breakfast this morning. Now, this is an issue for me. I'll confess that to you today. This is an issue for me in my life. You know, if I don't get enough sleep the night before, if I'm tired, that's obviously not ideal, but that's why God invented coffee, and I can handle that. But when I'm hungry, when I want food, and there is no food, it can be dangerous to be around me. 
especially if my children are misbehaving. They start to smell good <laughs> in all the wrong ways. Now, like I said, I doubt that this was an issue for Jesus, but we know that he was fully man, and we know that he was hungry. We know that hunger affects us. It affects our judgment. It affects our ability to make uh, good decisions. But here's the deal, and this is important. I don't know any other way to say this. He may have been physically weak from this, but he was spiritually strong. Jesus may have been physically weak, but he was spiritually strong. And the reason that I say that is because Jesus' time in the desert fasting was more than just time spent not eating. It was time spent preparing for what was to come. He knew that he was going to be tempted, and because of that, he prepared for it. And this is a big deal for you and me because we need to expect to be tempted, and we need to prepare for it. Jesus knew he would be tempted. You need to know that you will be tempted. So many people, I truly believe this, so many people allow temptation to become sin in their lives, not because they are especially weak and not because the temptation was especially strong or clever, but simply because they were not ready for it. We have this tendency to think, I don't need to worry about that. That's not a problem for me. I'll be fine. Satan can't get me in you know, whatever area of my life this is. And so we're not ready for it when it happens. 1 Peter 5 verse 8 says, Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Now I know this and you know this. The devil is not like God. The devil is not everywhere. But that doesn't change the fact that temptation is an ever-present reality in our lives. And I really believe the first big step we can take to stand against it is to not be surprised when it happens. It's not a sin to be tempted. In fact, it's a reality of life. All right. Let's look at it, what it is Satan exactly did. Matthew chapter 4, verses 3 and 4 say this. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now, right away, we may experience a couple of temptations uh, of our own. You know, one, we think, well, this can't possibly apply to me. I can't turn stones into bread. Satan could come before me and tempt me to do this all day long, and you know what? I could withstand that temptation all day long because it cannot be done. Another temptation, maybe, is to downplay this a little bit because, you know what? He isn't really asking Jesus to do anything wrong. There's no law against turning stones into bread. Also, we see Jesus perform food-related miracles other places in the Bible. We know that he turns water into wine. We know that he feeds thousands of people with fish and loaves a couple of times. So it's not like we don't see similar powers on display other places in Scripture. Where does the real temptation come from? I mean, is it, is it simply that Satan is asking him to do something, and so therefore, no matter what it is, it's a sin. It's wrong. Here's where I think we see our first foundational truth. The first thing we really need to uh, uh, think about and, and the first way that we can really relate to Jesus when it comes to these temptations. So write this down next to number one in your handout. We are tempted to doubt God's provision. We are tempted to doubt God's provision. Satan's tactics, you know, they're not new. They're not revolutionary, but they don't have to be because we continue to fall for them. And this is what we see in Matthew 4. Satan begins by questioning Jesus. If you are the Son of God, not since you are the Son of God, do this. If you are the Son of God. We see this again in the second temptation. And the truth is, we've seen this all, from, all the way from the beginning. Genesis chapter 3. Did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And you might disagree with me. I don't think it's even the part about the tree that's crucial. I think it's the, it's the shadow cast over God's command. Did God really say? Did, did you hear him right? Do you think that's really what he meant? And this is the same for you and for me. We're tempted to doubt who we are, what God has given us, what God wants for us, what God says is best for us. You know, looking at, looking at Jesus, he was hungry. And Satan goes straight for his obvious need. And what he's telling him, 
What Satan is telling Jesus is he's saying, you know what, God isn't going to take care of you, so you need to take care of yourself. Now, I'm sure that that's a temptation many of us can relate to. God isn't going to take care of you, so you need to take care of yourself. God isn't doing this, so I need to do this. Jesus has a real and a legitimate need, and Satan tempts him to fulfill that need on his own. He doesn't come with promises of wealth and fame. He doesn't tempt Jesus with power. He doesn't do these things yet, not in the beginning. Rather, he says, you're hungry, and you shouldn't be hungry. So you need to fix that. We all know what it's like. We all know what it's like to have real and legitimate needs. Sometimes it is. It's the bare necessities. It's food. It's water. It's clothing. It's shelter. Sometimes it's emotional needs. It's a need for love. It's a need for forgiveness and grace, a need for some kind of deep healing in our lives. Whenever we doubt God's provision, whenever we try to fulfill those needs on our own and in in ways that are, are separate from God and God's plan, We open the door to all kinds of trouble. Whenever we say things like, you know, if God really loved me, then he would feed my family. If God really loved me, then I wouldn't experience any kind of financial burden in my life. You know, if God really loved me, then I wouldn't be sick. We doubt God's provision. We doubt God's care. We doubt God's love for us. there's There's a danger in assuming that anything negative can't possibly be a part of God's plan. For his part, Jesus quotes Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. By doing that, he basically says it's better to obey God and to suffer than it is to disobey God and have comfort. He says, you know, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Is that the attitude that you have? Is that the attitude that we, we should have? You know, it's better to obey God and to suffer than it is to disobey God and have comfort? This is hard. This is difficult. I'm not going to pretend that it isn't, but that doesn't change the power and the truth in these words. Write this down next to number two in your handout. We're tempted toward entitlement. We are tempted toward entitlement. Matthew 4, verses 5 through 7. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, there's the question again, the doubt, If you were the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Satan's tactics, you know, they might not be new, they might not be original, but uh, they're clever. Jesus wins the first round by saying that, that man lives by the word of God, so Satan comes at him in round two with the word of God. He puts Jesus in this situation, then he basically says, you know, you can do that. You can jump. Look what it says in the Bible, the Bible that you claim to love and live by. See, look what it says. You'll be fine. Go ahead and do it. And again, we ask the question, you know, what's the temptation here? Is it a sin for Jesus to jump? And I kind of want to pause here. You know, point number two, it's a little bit different than the other ones, but I think that there's an issue here that is really valuable that I want to spend a couple minutes talking about. Uh, Here's the deal. I think that oftentimes when we find ourselves in certain situations, we end up asking the wrong question. We, We think of sin as being simply a line that we cross. You've done something bad now. And and listen, that's not incorrect. That's not an incorrect way to think. There are certain things that are simply put always wrong, always sin. But at the same time, I think it's helpful for us to think about sin and to think about righteousness in terms of a direction that we are heading rather than a line that we cross. And so what this means is that instead of asking, is this a sin, we ask the question, does this glorify God? Does this this strengthen my relationship with God? Does this build up God's church? Does this make me a better witness? I, I mean, Jesus knew, Jesus knew that for him to jump was not a part of God's plan. So he didn't do it. It didn't matter that, you know, there would have been witnesses there. It didn't matter that people would have seen what happened and it would have been proof of who he was. 
Jesus knew that it was not what God wanted, so he didn't do it. There's a great verse. I just want to read one, one verse to you. There's a great verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that deals with this. Paul is writing to the church in Corinth, and, and he's writing to them about a believer's freedom. And there's all sorts of questions about um, meat sacrificed to idols. You know, can I eat it? Is it wrong to eat it? Is it a big deal to eat it? Does it even matter? And all of these issues. And so, and, and you know, there's a, that's obviously a whole other sermon. But within that chapter, Paul writes this verse, and I think it sums things up for us really well this morning. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23, we read this. Everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible, but not everything is constructive. I mean, Jesus knew. Jesus knew what Psalm 91 said. That's the passage that Satan quoted to him. But Jesus also knew not to test God. He also knew that to jump was to be selfish, to presume upon God's grace. He knew that to jump was to try and force God's hand, to to prove something, to do something that wasn't in God's time. These are things you and I should never do. But I know that we're tempted to do them. We're tempted to force God's hand. We're tempted to presume upon God's grace. We're tempted to do things we know we shouldn't do and fall back on the Scripture, not as as strength and, and comfort, but as some kind of leverage. Think of the first temptation like this. Think of the first temptation like this. It's the temptation to say, I can do that because God isn't doing it for me. I think that's a temptation we've all dealt with. And you can think of the second temptation like this. I can do that because God never said that I couldn't. I can do that because God never said that I couldn't. And listen, I want to say something very clear to you this morning, okay? I am not trying to add any rules or make things any harder for us. I realize that we speak where the Bible speaks and we're silent where the Bible is silent. And just because the Bible is silent on an issue does not mean that it is automatically sin. I'm not saying that at all this morning. What I am trying to do is to get us to change the nature of the questions that we ask when we find ourselves in certain situations. And instead of simply falling back on the idea of, well, is it a sin? Say, how does it bring glory to God? Does it bring glory to God? How does it strengthen my family? How does this make me a better husband and a father? How does this make me a better wife and a mother? How does this make me a better Christian? I think these are the questions that we should ask. Number three, write this down in your notes next to number, uh, number three. We are tempted to turn from God. We are tempted to turn from God. Matthew 4, verses 8 through 11. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended him. Now, okay, you could argue that every temptation has this in common. Whenever we're tempted, whenever we sin, aren't we always turning away from God? Yes, absolutely. I'm not going to tell you that you're wrong there in any way. But when it comes to sin, some things are more blatant, some things are more dangerous, some things have greater consequences than others. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this this morning, honestly, because this is its own sermon. This is such a um, specific and and difficult issue to explain. So what I want to do this morning is just share a couple of passages with you that I believe highlight this truth in our lives so that we can um, grasp it and understand it in in a real way to help us from a foundational level. So in Matthew chapter 12, verses 31 and 32, we read these words. And so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Both of these things are sins. Both of these things are wrong, but clearly one of them is presented as far more severe than the other. And this is just a reality that we read about in Scripture. 
In 1 John 5, verses 16 and 17, it says, If you see any brother or sister commit a sin that does not lead to death, you should pray, and God will give them life. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. I'm not saying that you should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin, and there is a sin that does not lead to death. Again, all wrongdoing is sin. That's what we see here. But there is a sin that leads to death. There is a sin that does not lead to death. There is, in some way, a difference, and we need to be aware of that. What we see in Matthew 4 is a progression. You know, the stakes are, are raised with each round, and we need to be able to recognize in our own lives which sins have greater consequences than others. That's obviously not a license to ever sin, but it helps us not to underestimate our enemy. You know, Satan was offering the world to Jesus, but it wasn't on God's terms. It was on his terms. And Jesus, he already knew. He already knew that he would rule one day, but he also knew what would happen in order to bring that about. And so what Satan does is he offers him a shortcut. Satan offers him the crown without the cross. He says, I'll give all of this to you, and you won't have to go through the crucifixion. You just need to bow down to me. You and I, we are offered shortcuts every day when it comes to temptation. We are offered comfort without commitment. We're offered pleasure without perseverance. We're offered happiness without hope. We're offered everything superficial that Satan can throw at us because he knows that none of it will satisfy. None of it will satisfy. And one of the best things that we can do to help deal with this kind of temptation in our lives is to always have an eternal perspective on life. Not just how something affects me here and now, not just how I feel today or tomorrow, but how will this affect eternity? Here's the truth, and Brian, you can go ahead and come get ready to to play. Satan tempts us with everything and anything, but it will cost us our lives. God offers us everything, and it costs the life of his son. That's the truth. I hope that this morning you're going to be able to leave here and to think about your life and to ask yourself the questions, you know, what's What's the problem underneath the problem? How can I strengthen my foundation? I hope you're going to be able to look back at this this passage of Scripture and think about the ways that Jesus dealt with temptation. And you think, how can I learn from this? How can I grow and be stronger next time so that you can stop dealing with just the symptoms and get rid of the disease? That's my goal. Let's pray. God, thank you so much. Thank you so much for what we see in Matthew chapter 4. Thank you for the the power of this passage, for the reality that we know Jesus faced temptation. Jesus knows what it's like. Help us to draw strength and encouragement from that. Help us to look at our own lives and to be honest about the things that we're doing, about whether or not we're just trying to to manage our sin and to get our things, our, our life under control, rather than trying to defeat it and to get rid of the disease. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. We're gonna have our our decision time like we always do. We're gonna have people.